Celeb Savant is a career retrospective type interview focusing on singers, actors and industry experts. Join Barrett Edelstein now as he dives into the entertainment world. For 30 years, American Randy Slovacek enjoyed a successful career in theater performing on Broadway, in Chicago, Follies, and Hello Dolly, across the U.S. and around the world in Cats, A Chorus Line, 42nd Street, and Chicago. During that time, he was proud to help organize and participate in some of the earliest fundraising efforts for Broadway Cares, Equity Fights AIDS, one of the nation's leading non-profit AIDS fundraising and grant-making organizations. Transitioning to the role of director or choreographer, Randy's work has been seen across the U.S. from the 11,000-seat Muni Theatre in St. Louis to 99-seat off-Broadway theatres in New York City. Credits include choreographing and supervising the national touring company of Hello Dolly, starring the legendary Carol Channing, staging the world premiere of Playing Crazy of Broadway, several companies of A Chorus Line, West Side Story, Chicago the Musical, Victor Victoria, and many more. Now a full-time Las Vegas resident with husband of 30 years Michael Caprio, Randy is a freelance writer covering issues that affect the LGBTQ plus community. His blog, The Randy Report, launched in 2011, covers the daily news cycle in terms of politics, pop culture, and entertainment news of interest to the LGBTQ plus community and its allies. The Randy Report has been honored with the 2024 GLAAD Media Award nomination for Outstanding Blog. He is a proud member of the National Lesbian Gay Journalists Association and the Society of LGBTQ plus Entertainment Critics. Up next on Celeb Savant, we've got Randy Slovacek. Where in the world are you and how are you doing? I am talking to you from Las Vegas, Nevada in the United States. It's a beautiful day. But I think it gets quite hot there. Right now, it's about 82. Okay. So but this cool. summer, it'll get to be about 115. Oh, my word. <laughs> yeah. That's intense. Dry yeah. heat, though. We always talk about it's dry heat, so it's not so bad. Yeah. So, uh, we I'm- say in the air conditioning. So, I mean, in Johannesburg, also, we've got dry heat. It's not humid. And I much mm-hmm. prefer it because I lived in uh, London and Israel, and that gets humid. Yes. And I hate that. You, like, shower, and the next thing you're out the door, and you're just sweating, sopping wet. Sweating. I can't stand that. Yes. I hate that. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Randy, you've had an interesting, fascinating journey. So, let's start at the very beginnings. The hybrid journey, because I know it's multiple of decades. So, at mm-hmm. what age did you think, whether as a child or as a teenager, that cool? You want to be in this entertainment world and journey, and you've had different facets in it. Let's touch point on your uh, on stage a career in the theater, being behind the scenes in choreography, and then what led to it next. So let's dive into your world and your journey. I think the first time I ever performed, I was in fifth grade in school, and there was a talent contest, and I was asked to sing. I liked music class, and so the music teacher said, oh, you should sing something. And I sang... Uh, the Tony Orlando and Dawn hit yes. tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree I remember in so, a yeah. bright yellow suit. <laughs> um, yes. And from that first time on stage, I just knew I liked being on stage. And the more I paid attention to the performing arts as a kid, I, in the seventies, I would watch all the variety shows with the dancers and the singers. Mm. And I thought, Ooh, I want to be that. That sounds like a cool job. And I didn't realize it at the time. I was a big fan of Donny Osmond Mm. when I was really little. And I think at the time it wasn't so it well, no, I I appreciated his talent, but I also realized years later, I wanted to be Donny Osmond. I wanted to be that talented. I wanted to be that loved. And it just was a springboard from there throughout the rest of school. I was in music classes. When I got to sixth grade, someone suggested I auditioned for the world famous Texas boys choir. And I was accepted. And so for three years, I did that. And I ended up touring the nation, like 40 states, uh, on a bus and truck tour with the Texas Boys Choir in eighth grade. So I was already touring at at eighth grade. What is that? 13 years old, 12 years old. Oh, wow. 
I get to high school and my freshman year, they're doing a, a, a stage musical. It was Gypsy. And I mm. tried out just because I liked this first musical I ever did. And I loved it. And from that point on, it, oh, one more thing. So when I'm in Gypsy, someone said the music teacher says, oh, you move well. You should take dance classes. It had never occurred to me to take dance. Class. I just wanted to sing and act and, yeah. and all of that. So I started taking a dance class at my local theater. And that was it, period. Suddenly, I was a dancer. I, when you're a boy who dances in the theater, you are a dancer. And I ended up going to college, getting my BFA in musical theater. And even though I went there as an actor and a singer and a dancer, the department decided, ooh, you dance, you're a dancer. And so it kind of pigeonholed me, but I never gave up on, I always considered myself an actor and a singer, even yeah. if I was dancing on stage. And from there, I moved to New York, had a really hideous first year in New York. It was awful. I was auditioning for everything, couldn't get a single job. And I was getting up at six in the morning, going to any and every audition. I would go to Broadway auditions. I would get to the end and I'd get cut. Years later, I started to understand why I, you know, you get to Broadway auditions and the choreographer has probably already done a workshop with their favorite dancers anyway. So they know who they're going to use. Oh, okay. But the union requires you to hold an audition or maybe you need two or three people. So I'd be going to an audition where a lot of the dancers were already cast, but they'd keep me there. And because I was new casting directors, choreographers, they'd keep me because they were interested. But by the end of the day, uh, we know who we're using and we're hiring this guy over here who's done seven Broadway shows. Yeah. And I understand. Anyway, a, a year of, of cleaning apartments and waiting on tables and all of that. And I go to an audition for a brand new touring company of Cats, the musical, as I like to joke back in when it was a good credit, um, when nobody had done it. This is 1986. And after <laughs> Sorry, seven... I, just, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I did it, like I, I ended up being cast after seven auditions as the magical Mr. Mistopheles. Yes. And I toured for two years all over the United States. I mean, it was an amazing, amazing opportunity. At that point, I think only five people on the planet had done my role. When I say like, but when it was a good credit, like so few companies had happened by then. Yeah. Anyway, that I go back to New York. I think I'm somebody now. No, <laughs> I go back to auditioning. It takes me nine months to get another job. I do a national tour of a course line. And from there, I was kind of on a roll. And I ended up doing national tours of 42nd Street, a course line. Hello, Dolly. Hello, Dolly took me to Broadway with uh, the legendary Carol Channing. Mm. And Hello, Dolly was two and a half years of my life working with Carol. It was awesome. It was just a beautiful experience. And, and I, I highly recommend if you're going to do your first Broadway show, this is a really great way to do it. We were such a happy company. Nobody left the company for 20 months. Oh, well. Which is unusual. Usually people do like a year and think, oh, I'm going to move on now. Yeah, yeah. We were out on the road for a long time. We came into Broadway and then after Broadway, the director asked me to stage the national tour. So now I'm telling people, I'm starting to be a choreographer again. Okay. And I'm telling, I'm giving Carol Channing notes on how to do Hello, Dolly. Who could imagine that? <laughs> yes. um, and so at that point, then other things followed from there. And I ended up doing Chicago, the musical on Broadway, national tours uh, in Europe. Uh, I was in the first Broadway revival of Stephen Sondheim's Follies. And then I transitioned into directing and choreographing and I started directing all over the United States and winning awards. Uh, sorry to brag, but if we're going to include the details, winning no, let's, awards and let's, let's blow our trumpets. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I was successful at it. And people asked me all over the, all over the country to come and direct and choreograph. And, and then about where are we now? 2014, 13 years ago, uh, I was at home in Las Vegas and my morning routine began with getting my coffee and reading LGBTQ blogs to catch up on the news. I just kind of discovered this and became my thing. And then one day my husband, Michael said, oh, you should start a blog. And I'm like, what? And he goes, no, you should start a blog. And I remember thinking, oh, and it'll be really sad. Two people will read it, you and me. <laughs> and so I, I started the Randy Report in January of 2011. And in the first... Two weeks, I think I had 
like 300 people read it because I would share links on Facebook. Yes. My friends would come look. And then if we're just going to jump forward in about two years, I, it grew to have about 200,000 readers a month, oh, wow. <laughs> which blew my mind. I thank you to all of you people for, for reading me and, and coming back. It's much more fun when you're there. Um, and then that led to me having a podcast of the same name, The Randy Report. Yeah. And I cover the daily news cycle in terms of politics, pop culture, and entertainment news of interest to the LGBTQ community. And here we are, what are we, 13 years later, which I never expected. I don't think I've missed a day on the blog in seven years of posting at least something. And the blog has led me to become a freelance writer with other publications, uh, both gay and just mainstream entertainment, like ET Online, Entertainment Tonight, oh, wow. and, and other uh, publications. Uh, the long-running LGBTQ outlet, uh, Instinct Magazine, approached me six years about coming on as a writer, and now I'm a senior editor there. And it's been a great ride. This year, I'm really uh, proud to share that I've been honored with uh, a nomination by the Glad Media Awards for outstanding blog, which blows my mind, and I'm I'm thrilled about that. Um, and that's kind of how I got here. I love what I do. I've always been lucky that I've loved everything I do, whether it was singing and dancing and acting, or transitioning unexpectedly into being a journalist, which I never saw coming. It's interesting because I've also unexpectedly become a journalist through uh, being the host of the podcast and producing it and so forth. I never expected it, but it's just like, well, here we go. <laughs> exactly. Congratulations for the nomination. That's fantastic news. And mazel tov, that's amazing. Now let's rewind. What did you enjoy about being on stage? What was the enjoyment about acting and playing a character on stage? Strangely enough, I felt comfortable. You see people have stage fright in, in the TV and movies. You see mm -hmm. actors being on stage for the first time and they freeze. They have stage yeah. fright. I have never, ever had stage fright. And even just the working in the theater, when, when there's not an audience in the theater, when we're rehearsing or when I'm directing choreographing, when I'm standing in the back of a theater and I'm, I'm taking notes on what it is I'm directing, it's just a comfortable place for me. It, it just always has been, um, which sounds kind of funny. In A Chorus Line, we talk about how you're working in the dark, practically. You, these dark spaces, theaters and everything. That's my happy place. And also, I just got affirmation being there from, from the very beginning, the first time I did it. I'm not saying I was great. I'm not going to say the quality of what I did. Yeah, I, I'll let other people judge that. But people responded to what I did. And, you know, I think when you see kids and they show mechanical aptitude, you know, my brother was just brilliant with, he could take an electrical socket apart at the age of 10 and put it back together without killing himself and things like that. People tend to lean in and go, Oh, good for you. Look at you. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That was me in the theater is yeah, yeah, yeah. people just responded. And I, I liked that I was comfortable there and that people seemed to like what I would do. You reference being pigeonholed as a dancer. Back when you were on stage, was it not a situation of being sort of in inverted commas, as they call today, a triple threat, a singer, dancer, and actor? Was it not like that then? And was it more sort of categorized into specific labels? Can you explain further? Well, what happened was in college, even though it was a music theater program where you learn to sing, dance, and act, yeah. they have to cast the shows. And invariably, even though I would be considered for a lead, they needed people to dance. And almost by default, I got shifted into being a dancer because they needed someone to do it. Yeah. And I was one of the few boys who was good at it. So that's what I say. I, I kind of by default became this dancer. And so there was a lot of focus on that in college, whether I was even aware that this strength was developing. So okay. then I go to New York. And when I went to New York, I would go to singing auditions. I would go to acting auditions. I would go to dance. But the dance auditions, I would just stand out. And suddenly it, the idea slowly forms in your head. Well, I better lean into this because people want to pay me for this. Oh, okay, got it. But I would go on after a few years in New York. I was doing singing roles in regional theaters. I, I was playing the role of Jack in Stephen Sondheim's Into the Woods. I was doing different singing roles and everything. But 
it was almost a fight to get out of that box because once people knew, know you as a dancer, well, Randy's a dancer. Oh, yes. Randy's a dancer. I'm like, yeah, but I also like doing that. The other thing that you can do to break out of that is when I was in Hello, Dolly, I was an understudy for the role of Barnaby. When I was in Chicago, I was an understudy for the role of Amos Hart, Mr. Cellophane. Yes. And when I was in Follies, I was an understudy for one of the principals also. So you you kind of help get yourself out of that box by trying to play principal roles, even if it's as an understudy yeah, to yeah. show people, hey, I have this too. Were there any theater productions that were on your bucket list that you did not have an opportunity to perform in? Or were there any productions that came out during your period of being on stage and you thought, oh, this is a great show. I'd like to perform in this. When I finished being in Cats in the late 80s, uh, Jerome Robbins, the brilliant director choreographer, was doing a retrospective of all of his Broadway choreography. And while I was in Cats, I flew into New York for an audition and that turned into a series of eight auditions. They kept calling me back. And this was going to be the show that all of the quote unquote Broadway dancers were going to be in. There were, there were more than 50 dancers in the show. And I'll cut to the chase. I ended up doing eight auditions. Finally, I was closing Cats in Boston in August of, of 88. And I called into my voice on my message service in New York, because back then we didn't have cell phones or yeah. beepers. You had a voice service. And I called and they said, no, there are no new messages, but there is one from the Robbins Project from a month ago. And I'm like, what? So I called the casting director and they said, yeah, we wanted to hire you, but we didn't hear from you. So we had to move on. And it was gone. I was going to be cast in the original cast of Jerome Robbins Broadway, this very prestigious thing. And but they were great. I have to say this part, too. Because the casting director felt like, because they should have followed up and left a second message or yeah. something. Come on. They were great to me. Jay Bender was the casting director. God bless him. And every time there was an opening in Jerome Robbins Broadway, they called Randy Slavacek. <laughs> and I think they called me 12 more times to any time I could replace in the show, they would call me. And I'd go dance the choreography all over again. And twice they hired me they told me on the spot okay you're hired because someone was leaving yeah and later that week the dancer rescinded his notice ah. and they had to call me and say oh hey listen mark bovey's not leaving so we can't bring you in uh, the second time people were going to leave to go do the los angeles company and they needed per well then they canceled the los they postponed the los angeles company so they called and said hey we were going to hire you but we postponed the la company so no one's leaving new york so it's just this constant thing every time i'd walk past the marquee in new york and look at jerome robbins broadway i'm like man this has got to happen um and it was just such a prestigious thing and it was it was that close that close but that was probably the one that got away that yeah. kind of was the hardest for me. Um, there were other shows that I wanted to do, but uh, that was the one. I wanted to do Cats on Broadway, and they just never called, even though they I had did the role. The supervisors in Cats changed in the middle of my run, uh, okay. and they kind of wanted to discover their own people. Yeah. So if you were in Cats before them, once my company closed, they were kind of like, you can go away and we'll discover our own people because that's just who those people were. And that happens. Was there ever an overlap in time whereby you were directing, choreographing and starring in a show at the same time? Or was it a clean transition going straight into, okay, now I'm only choreographing and directing? Yes, there was overlap. Like my first big job choreographing was the national tour of Hello, Dolly with Carol Channing. Uh, yes, okay. That was in yes. the mid to late uh, 90s. And... As soon as I finished, and I was still in the show, Carol wanted me to still be in the show because she liked familiar faces on stage. So even though I staged it, I was still out on tour and giving her notes and everybody notes, but I was also in the show and being in a Barnaby understudy and everything. But just a year after that, Chicago, the musical picked me up in LA and then sent me to uh, one of the national touring companies, to another company, to Broadway. After that, I was starting to work in regional theater. So I'm staging Chicago now in San Diego and Sacramento, and I'm staging Hello, Dolly. I'm doing West Side Story here. I'm doing Victor Victoria there. And then I'd go back into Chicago. Um, Chicago hired me, blessfully, uh, 13 times on 13 separate contracts. Oh, wow. And I would do it for a month, and they, that would, they just need me for a month as a temporary replacement. 
And then, or I'd go out on the road for a year or they'd need me for two weeks. So I always tell people 13 times they hired me of different links. But as soon as I finished that, the last Chicago, Follies on Broadway happened almost by accident. And so that happens. And I come back to Las Vegas and I'm hired to stage West Side Story in San Diego. And so, yeah, there was definitely overlap. But slowly in the in the early 2000s, I transitioned out of performing a, a bit. I will say, though, the last time I performed on stage in 2013, Chicago, the musical for the 13th time, uh, they were doing it at the Hollywood Bowl in L.A. And I was going to turn 50 on my birthday, the day we opened, they called me seven weeks in advance. They said, hey, do you want to come to Chicago again? And I said, sure. I hadn't danced in a couple of years at that point. I was not in, if you've seen Chicago the Musical, we wear tight, sexy black clothes. I was yeah. not in tight, sexy black clothes shape. <laughs> and in seven weeks, because the industry had left me with just this tiny, tiny, tiny sliver of an ego, tiny, I was not going to get on stage in tight, sexy black clothes and not look good. So in seven weeks, I lost 20 pounds oh, wow. and got back in shape. And I sent you a picture of me in that production. And I was happy the day we opened, I stepped on the scale. I was weighing myself every day. I had a goal weight yeah. and I, I got there the day we opened. Um, but that was the last time I performed on stage was in uh, 2013. Explain to us, what does it mean to be a choreographer in a theater production? What are your tasks? What does it mean? Well, it's interesting because uh, even in shows that we don't think of as big, heavy dance shows, we think of West Side Story, we think of Hello, Dolly, we think of mm -hmm. Chicago. All of those are big, heavy dance shows. And yeah. that's for a long time, that's what I would get hired for because people just had me in mind for that. And it's a lot of work. And But I love those shows. And having worked with a lot of those people, A Course Line, I worked with a lot of the originals from A Course Line. So I've always been a curious person, which led to yep. me being a journalist. But I've been a curious person. So when I would work, I did the National Tour of A Course Line with Donna McKechnie, the original Tony Award winner for A Course Line. I would ask all these questions. Well, what does this mean? What does this dance step mean? Or why are we doing this? Or when I did... Um, uh, Chicago, I would ask Anne Reinking, what does this mean? What does this mean? So when I could stage it, I could speak authoritatively, like, we're not just doing a kickball change because it looks cute. We're doing this because it means something. And, you know, the really great dancing in theater means something. You don't ever do anything just to kickball change. I'm also enamored of the fact that people don't think about it. Like, for instance, one of the shows I did just a few years ago, and I always wanted to do, was South Pacific. Because it's a show I love. It's an incredible story. It's an incredible score. It's not a big dance show at all. I mean, it's it's what we would call musical staging. Yes. But I always wanted to do it because I liked working with the actors, not dancers, but actors who move well. And still, all of the movement, whether you're staging There's Nothing Like a Dame or Happy Talk, all of the movement still has to be character appropriate. It has to be coming out of the moment. And I wanted to challenge myself and do that too. So sometimes you're not doing the big dance things, but you're still just as involved in making it mean something, being character driven. And that's really the fascinating thing for me uh, is, is again, going back to, I always thought I was an actor. When I'm choreographing, I'm still thinking in terms of acting because luckily that's how I was brought up. I'm almost 100% certain that having been a dancer, performer, act on the shows, definitely does help and give you foundations when it comes to being a choreographer and a director. When you're a choreographer on a show, are you there for the full run, the rehearsals, opening night, the full run of it being on stage? Or at what point do you step away from being involved? Generally, opening in regional theaters, opening night, you're there, you congratulate everyone, and they send you home. The regional theater isn't going to house you and keep you there and giving notes and everything. You have a dance captain. You hire one of the dancers specifically to pay attention to what it is you're passing along, and then they have the authority every now and then. If they see something that just needs to be cleaned up, they have the authority to give someone a note and all of that. But with regional theaters, that's the case. With the National Tour of Hello, Dolly, I did. I was out there, but I was performing in it and, as I mentioned, um, and supervising. Moving on to the next phase of your career, and when Michael suggested that you write or start the blog, was it a thought process of, I'm not sure I can do it, or with a bit of self-doubt, 
Or was it something that you had never even thought of? I had just never thought of it. Okay. The one thing is I leaned into it because I, I used to joke with people. I was the guy that when someone wanted to write a letter to the editor, hey, Randy, you write it. You write well. Um, I was good with language. I never thought of myself as a writer. And so I started the blog, not even know what I was going to write about. My the, my first post was about my father and how he was, he had no fear. He lived with no fear whatsoever. He traveled the world because he loved traveling. He would travel alone. He wouldn't like just go with a travel group. He'd travel alone. Yeah. He loved going everywhere. My mother passed away when I was five years old. He very courageously, bravely raised two boys on his own. Um, he took us everywhere. He really instilled in us this idea of to get out and live life. Yeah. And I didn't know that when I was a kid, but that's what he was doing. And I wrote about this and I ended the post by summing that up, speaking uh, at his funeral and just remembering that he really instilled this idea of no fear. And that's how I ended the first blog post. I had no idea what I was going to write about. I figured LGBTQ issues. And the interesting thing about the blog is over these 13 years, I never expected to become a news outlet, but that's what blogs transitioned to yeah. since 2011. And so now you have websites like mine, uh, joemygod.com, Toll Road, and we are a news outlet uh, for LGBTQ news, whether it's entertainment, whether it's politics. I didn't set out to do that, but it was just a natural progression. And it also, once I realized, oh, I can write about this, it gave me kind of a, a, a focus that I kind of didn't have. Are you still doing your podcast as well? Yes. Yes. Every, every two weeks, I, it's mainly, I do interviews like you, or I hope to be like you. Um, I've had the podcast for seven years now. And uh, the bulk of what I do is what I would refer to as a news magazine. I recap the news, the headlines in terms of politics, entertainment, pop culture. I introduce LGBTQ out recording artists. I talk about gay movies, uh, gay themed movies. Mm. I cover the politics, but I fit it into, for me, what I've learned because 90, per, I'd say 80% of my episodes are this news magazine thing, kind of like 60 minutes here in the States where they do like five or six stories in an hour yes. and they cover it. 80% of what I do are those. And I also do interviews uh, with celebrities. Um, but I do that, but I do it in 15 to 20 minutes max because yes. I found, I used to blather on and I'd go on for 30 minutes by myself doing these news magazines. And one time I was short and it was only 15 minutes and my numbers almost doubled. <laughs> Shut up, Randy. We don't <laughs> Get to it. <laughs> so, so I find when it comes to the news, people like to catch up on the news in a quick 15 minute podcast. Yeah. And so that's what I do now. What's next? So you've got the editorial jobs, the podcast, the blog. Is that what you're going to focus on? Is that enough busyness for you in your day to day? Or is there anything else coming up in the pipeline? Right now, that's busy enough for me. Okay. It really is. I am about, to, I have been asked, I'm going back into the theater uh, next January. I've been asked to direct and choreograph Hello, Dolly, which I haven't touched in about seven years. So I'm going to back to revisit that. But the bulk of my, my life is I sit down at my desk and I wake up at five because the three dogs get us up. It's time to eat. <laughs> and by six or seven, I'm sitting at my desk and I'm reading through all the news and I'm sifting through what it is I'm going to write about that day. And I'm usually at my desk till about five or six every day. And uh, I like what I do. I really do. I have friends who have moved into other industries like real estate and stuff. And, you know, I we've bought and sold houses uh, as, as a kind of a pastime in the past. Mm -hmm. I like that too, but I love what I do. Yeah. I like being in the, in the, in the, in the news, being in the mix of the daily news and understanding, you know, not just reading a headline and thinking I've read the news. Mm -hmm. I like to understand. So when I'm at a cocktail party or something, you know, some people will say, and I don't mean this in the wrong way. People say, how do you know that? And my first thought is, how do you not? But I've been curious my whole life. My brother, uh, Michael always says, why do you have to know? And I'm like, I just want to know. <laughs> I'm curious. I don't want to, I don't want to think I know. I want to know. Yeah. So anyway, that it, it fills my life. I like it. So the podcast is listened to throughout the world. So as a final message, what would you like to say? 
I just really appreciate people tuning in. I think the most rewarding thing for people listening to uh, the Randy Report podcast or the RandyReport.com, the blog, is I feel so great that I do have readers all around the world and I hear from them. Um, I have, there's one specific guy in Italy who emails me every now and then about certain stories. I, I have people I can see from my analytics. I'm sure you can too, where an episode has been listened to for the podcast. Yeah. And it's the Netherlands is I have listeners in Russia. I have listeners in Afghanistan, the, the bulk are in the U S and Australia and the UK. But when I see that people are listening and reading the blog and the podcast, the most rewarding thing is that people are interested in learning yeah. and that they are sharing this curiosity with me, that they want to be informed. And I just celebrate those people so much. I really do. I'm like, Oh, you're like me. You want to know. And I, with the podcast, I have a core set of audience. There's always this set number of people that are listening each episode. And the same thing with the blog. And I just think, God bless you. You want to know things. And I think the curious will always lead us forward because they'll never stop and be complacent. Yeah. And that for me, it inspires me to keep going. I'm like, oh, my tribe is out there. You, you want to learn too. And so that's really the most gratifying thing about all of this that's ever happened is, is that people are curious just like I am. Thank you for listening to this episode of Celeb Savant. Please follow Barrett on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook at Celeb Savant. That's C-E-L-E-B-S-A-V-A-N-T.